Glad to be with you, my friends. Let me share the screen, find the right page. Oh, it's going to be one right here. I can see you. <laughs> oh, that's that's what I was trying. I, I'm glad you can see me. That's a good step. Um, <laughs> trying to share the uh, PowerPoint for Romans here. Oh, I see. Good. There we go. All right. So. Uh -huh. Paul's argument, so we've done chapters one through four. That was sort of Paul's opening intro to the letter. Now we shift into chapter five, and five through eight have a full shift in Paul's argument. Um, that is, Paul begins to talk about Adam, and through Adam, sin and death is introduced to the world. So the Adam and sin and death are sort of brought to the forefront, along with the clear understanding that Paul has this very, he's, they're almost personified forces when he talks about sin and death. In any of his letters, uh, they are forces, they're not just forces to be opposed, they're also almost entities unto themselves that uh, we are powerless to oppose. We need somebody's help, God's help on, right? So then Adam introduces sin and with it death, and so then that Christ can in turn uh, introduce life uh, that's the that's super broad argument for five through eight, chapters five through eight. We're going to look at each chapter as we go here. But chapter five is that general idea, right? All right, so jumping straight in, here's the text. We'll look at five, one through 11, and then uh, 12 through the balance of the chapter. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, Will we be saved through him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. All right, so... Paul continues his argument, um, that is, now that we are justified, and that's sort of where we ended in chapter 4. So this is picking up all the streams, sort of 2, through two, three, and 4, into 5. Uh, we're justified through the crucifixion, through God's, through Christ's blood, that atoning sacrifice. But of course, Paul then covers all his bases and talks about it on three or four different times. But the argument is the same. The result is the more important part than the necessarily the process by which it happens. And that is that we are one with God. Atonement has been achieved. We are reconciled. And so that's the important part. And now that we are redeemed and we have this new life in Christ, life itself has new meaning. Okay. So before we, will sin we were sinful, we were broken. There was no real way to achieve salvation or to be reconciled to God. Even if there was a way, we weren't getting there. That is, uh, the covenant gave us an outline, but we had a hard time even staying true. To the covenant. And so um, now that we have this new life, Paul argues uh, everything has meaning. Even suffering now leads to hope, right? Um, of course, he has that Pauline ladder. Uh, suffering leads to endurance. Endurance leads to character. And character leads to hope. Every part of our life, the good and the bad, is now 
redeemed and part of God's larger. So here's Paul's first four chapters of legal arguments brought to fruition. Right? So, uh, or as N.T. Wright says, quote, all that God said to Abraham, all that God accomplished in the Messiah was done out of love and designed to call out an answering love. there that I didn't delete. <laughs> so for God loved us even when we were sinners, our nature, our natural response then should be love. That's Paul's basic argument here. Um, sometimes we need to really take apart Paul's arguments. I'm not sure this one is as complex or confusing as some of the other ones, although it might be. This one seems pretty darn clear to me, but uh, happy to, to see if y'all have questions. But it's Again, the basic idea is through Christ's life and death, we are reconciled to God, which gives us a peace. And so then even when things are bad, we're assured that God will welcome us home. Even more, since he died for us when we were sinners, how much more now that we are reconciled does God love us? Now we're back into God's grace and to love. How much better things are now for us? All through that God. Questions, thoughts, reflections on those first 11 verses there of Paul's letter? Uh, I, I'm trying to wonder why we need to suffer. To experience God's love, we need to suffer. Ah, yes. No, we, don't, we don't have to. It's just, it's just a benefit. It's a potential benefit. Yeah, but... I mean, he praises suffering. Paul is praising suffering in these verses. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, what, what Peterson says is we continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. Stephon, I mean, I think um, there's two ways to look at it, right? One is the objective way to talk about does God require or need us to suffer, right? Um, I, I would argue that Paul is writing in a more pastoral way. That is, the church in Rome has literally been beaten up, expelled, excluded. They've actually suffered for their faith, right? And so... Um, He's basically trying to encourage them to say, like, hey, it's been hard to be a Christian. It's hard to, you know, to be kicked out of the synagogue and the people you know there or to be in a place where you're alienated from family and others. Um, the sufferings that you've gone to have, have already gone through are not for naught, right? Not that he is uh, valorizing suffering, like, oh, you can't be a good Christian unless you've suffered. I think he's more responding to the reality of being a Christian in the first century. It was a hard gig to uh, begin in this new faith. That's how I take it anyway. Not so much that it's a requirement, it, that you're somehow a less perfect Christian if you haven't uh, suffered. I mean, I do think there's some theology out there our, our, uh, that's more in line with the virtue of suffering. Our, uh, who was the Pope who preceded Benedict? Francis. Who? One of the Francis. Francis. No, it was like John. Was, Paul? was it John? Was it John Paul? Uh, um, I, I remember when he was in poor health and and near the end. Yeah, they, he was saying, well, this was great because, you know, it was giving him a chance to suffer. <laughs> and this was, you know, what, what God was really calling him to do. Or, I mean, it was like, whoa, I thought, you know, I can't, I can't get into suffering quite that much. <laughs> yeah, right, right. No, I mean, yeah, there are certainly veins of Christianity that, that talk about how it's only in suffering that we can know God and only in suffering and, 
deprivation. Um, there's a long history of that, unfortunately, in Christianity. I don't, I don't buy those arguments. Um, not that I think everybody should have it easy, but uh, I don't know that we need to go out and seek suffering or persecution. Um, it's enough that we have to deal with the problems we have. I think suffering finds you easily enough. You don't have to go right. look. Right. <laughs> I agree, Stefan. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, I, I find God in beautiful things as well as in suffering. I tend to turn to God more in suffering uh, for answers or for help. Um, but I find God, oh, in such beautiful, small things, ordinary things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there is a vein, and I think it's probably accurate to say that uh, sometimes, uh, well, not eh, most of the time, but not all the time, uh, we do tend to turn to God a little bit more when things are harder than when things are going well. Right. Mm -hmm. Not to equate suffering to that, but there's certainly a, a part of that. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll, we'll keep plugging along then. Um, so the second half of the chapter, Paul really begins in earnest his new argument. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned. There is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. The free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. The free gift following many trespasses begins brings justification. If, because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, which much more surely will those, or much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation of all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The law came in with the result of the trespass multiplied. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that just as sin exercised dominion and death, so grace might also exercise dominion well, through justification leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, now we're beginning Paul's next argument, Adam as originator of sin. This is where we start. Um, now, we have to make some parenthetical commentary because people get anxious about this. Paul is not ignoring Eve or making some comment about her through omission or any of that kind of stuff, right? He knows the story of Adam and Eve. There's not an issue here. Uh, he was just giving, uh, Adam was the one, though, that was the first given the command to not eat of the fruit. He passed it on to Eve, but even more, um, where it really is going on is, as a case for centuries, you can talk about one person can serve as the example for all, in this case, not to say that women aren't included in sin or anything weird like that. It's just to say he is the exemplar. And it makes the argument easier to say through one man came sin, therefore through another man. So it's a rhetorical device more than it is. But that said, uh, there is a quick side note um, that I like to make whenever we refer to Adam. 
Um, Adam is not really a name. Um, that is, Adam comes from the Hebrew Adama, and Adama means dirt or dust. Adam is one who comes from the dirt or the ground, right? So uh, in the same way, Eve just means life. That's true. She's one who brings forth life, as all women do or, or can. Um, but the best translation I've seen of that moment where Adam is given his name, I will call you earthling for you come from the earth really what sort of goes on, or I'll call you dustling, or you come from the dust, um, is much more of this idea of Adam. We'll use it as a name, but it's just a reminder so that when God says, uh, you are dust to dust, you shall return, he is literally saying, Adam, you are dust to dust. Uh, and we're supposed to hear that echo of Adam. We're losing sound. Sound. Mm-hmm. You lost my sound? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're back, but we lost it, yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Anyway, it was just to say that uh, I will call you earthling from the earth uh, or dustling from the dust and from dust to dust, right? It, Adam is one of those names that's supposed to remind us of our mortality more than anything. All right. All that said, uh, Adam is the one, of course, who introduced sin and through it death. Uh, from one act of disobedience. He ate the forbidden fruit. Be it apple or pomegranate or whatever uh, we have guessed it to be through the centuries, he ate the wrong thing. And so sin is not reckoned without the law. Then it's what Paul says. We saw last week, reckon is really an accounting term. So what Paul is saying is not that there was no sin before the law. It's just that you couldn't count it, measure it. Uh, in the same way. So you couldn't measure sin or the degree of sinfulness without the law of Moses. You knew that they were sinful. We didn't get the degrees of sinfulness until we had the law to help us measure it. So God gave us the rule book. That's not to throw out the law or to say that the law is bad. The law just helps us measure or reckon to what degree we are sinful. Again, this is important things to consider because Lots of preachers for lots of centuries have said, oh, this is why we don't need any of those old laws of the Old Testament, um, which is not at all what Paul is saying, not even kind of. Paul is very clearly saying the law matters. It's just the law helps us understand how we've gone wrong and where we've gone wrong, right? And uh, with the added addition of, as any Jew would tell you, the law of Moses is really to help you be in right relationship with God. Um, so again, Paul's not saying that sin didn't exist without the law. Paul argues, uh, ultimately, though, from lesser, from greater to lesser and lesser to greater. That is, he's constantly comparing the simple act by Adam, this very small act of eating an apple or uh, eating that forbidden fruit, which is a very simple act, to what is the much greater act, both in terms of uh, its repercussions and in terms of the action itself, right? To die on our behalf. Um, even though we're sinful, God comes, lives amongst us, and chooses to die as one of us. A far greater act of submission and obedience than uh, Adam's. So while Adam introduced death, how much more powerful is Christ's to the greater in this case, and then he'll reverse it every now and then and say this is a greater gift compared to Paul. But the answers are the same either way. So, uh, actually, I'll pause there. This is getting into the next thing. Um, questions about Paul's basic argument. It's not really incredibly complex, but it's the idea of Jesus as the second Adam. Paul uses this in Corinthians and Ephesians and lots of different books. One, I mean, this is one of the through lines in his theology, I'm sure, is that while Adam introduced sin to the world, Jesus comes as the new Adam to remove sin. So did Paul think that everybody who lived and because they're human and fallible, and had sinned and removed themselves from closeness in their relationship with God, 
that their life was finite, that there was no hope of reunion after death with God? Uh, so there's a couple of things. One, Paul, uh, I, yeah, I think he probably would say that before Christ, there was no real way to get to heaven or that everyone would be found wanting at that final judgment day. Um, he seems pretty clear about that, even in the first part of this letter, right? That he talks about how everyone is sinful, everyone's broken, Jew or Greek, um, that we all have this debt to God that we cannot repay, as he uses in so many different terms and ways. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, but the key is, you know, our, Paul would not have the theology we have that you go straight to heaven when you die or that you go straight to hell when you die. Instead, Paul would have this idea that everybody's waiting for that uh, coming of the Messiah and for that final judgment day. that we're all in the ground until that moment. And then we're raised up on the same day for that decision and eternal life, wherever it may be. Does that answer your question? I think it does. Yes, it introduces a few more, but you've answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Okay, what, what yes. are some of the other questions? Let's go down the road. We'll be fine. No, I, we can put those aside, but I, I'm just thinking of my Roman Catholic father-in-law who, for various reasons, wanted to be put in the grave in his whole body. And because I think he's waiting for that day that he could be resurrected. Yeah, so, that's, so this is worth a side conversation easily. So this is why for a very long time, the church did not encourage or even allow, depending on the terminology, um, being burned or having any sort of idea uh -huh. of creation. Because yeah. our theology of the church and death has always been the same, and that is you're in the ground until God and Jesus come back to raise you up. And you don't want to be a pile of ashes. You want to have a body, right? And so you don't leave that. Um, this theology changed, and we can point to exactly when it changed. It changed with the advent of modern warfare. And we started, uh, people started being injured and maimed, and their bodies were so destroyed that even in death, they could not, either loved ones didn't know where the bodies were, right? The sort of classic missing in action, or uh, more that, uh, especially say during the Civil War or World War I, your child might die on some foreign battlefield with never a chance to know where they might be uh, or to what degree their body was even intact for that second resurrection. So that's literally between 1860 and 1910 is when the, th the theology around the world starts to shift and we start talking about someone being raised up to heaven immediately and being with God, not necessarily with their physical body. That's when we divorced the two. Um, that said, though, if you're really talking about scripture, there is nowhere in scripture that says you, your spirit goes to heaven without your body. Uh, we always have this idea that there will be a new earth, that God will make everything right here on earth. Uh, it'll be a sunny 72 degrees and perfect every day, I guess, in this perfect world. <laughs> and we just get to be together in our uh, resurrected physical bodies. So that's why... Certainly for a lot of old school Catholics, you do not get cremated because Jesus is going to raise you up on the last day and you need your whole body. Hmm. Um, it's also why there for a while we started, or and we still do, right? We still use formaldehyde and other things to preserve the body so that it doesn't, it's easier to raise up the full body and not uh, just bones from a natural decaying process. All of that gets caught up in it. Um, now the way the church has shifted is basically as that theology has shifted more and more to say that well you're already in heaven it doesn't matter where your body is that's when cremation started to become more and more okay combined with uh, a lot of people started to argue well if god can bring back whatever possible remnants of the people who died in 1500 a bc right <laughs> they're probably nothing but a pile of ash due to natural decay then if God can bring them back, surely he can bring back uh, the vials of ashes and those kinds of things um, in the modern world. So that's a sort of side of curses about uh, all of that, but that's that's how those theologies play through a lot in our, in our conversations. I had some conversations with some uh, 
conservative and orthodox Jewish friends of mine. This who, was after my brother died and he was cremated. And mm -hmm. they just were so upset that he was cremated because he said, your body is a temple of God and you shouldn't destroy the temple. Right. And they also said that when, as you just talked about how when, when that day comes, we'll all be raised up. So I guess the ashes and what have you. Sure. I think about when we were in Rome and we went in that one uh, tunnel where they had taken all the bones and stacked them, the arms here, the heads there, and so on. I mean, it, uh, right. it was, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it's a very interesting situation how that's going to happen. Anyway, the Jewish people, they were very upset that my brother was cremated because they said they didn't believe in that. So. But yeah. that's just, you know. Like, yeah, those, uh, yeah, and, and those, um, our Muslim brothers and sisters and our Jewish brothers and sisters mm -hmm. have a strict rule that the body should be in the ground within 24 hours. With that, again, that idea that you want to preserve it and keep it as that temple to God and just have it uh -huh. and move on. Just get in the ground and don't, don't wait around for a long delayed period and not do anything to it like drain the blood and replace it for formaldehyde or any of those sort of modern processes. Well, Paul um, speaks of Adam and Moses and Christ. And of course, um, Moses and Christ are historical figures. Mm -hmm. I mean, how is he referring to Adam is this as the you know the earthling the mud man who's who typifies humanity or is this as an actual historical person? I think he's approaching him as a historical person, but I think he would also be willing to have the conversation that this is how sin was introduced to the world, right? That it was uh, whether if it wasn't Adam, this literal first being. Some some human along the line started the problem <laughs> back in the day, right? I think Paul would probably have that conversation either way. Uh, with every with the with the um, level of conversation he has elsewhere, he seems perfectly capable of using metaphor and uh, those sort of apocryphal let let not apocryphal. Um, I don't know, but almost those um, Jungian archetypes uh, in a lot of ways, right? Just, oh the sin as a being almost as much as it is action or a power or principality as he refers to it. He's willing to use those terms in ways that can mean one literal person or larger. So that, that's a good question. I think, I think here he probably does refer to him almost as a person, but I think he'd be willing to say, or whoever that was who disobeyed. I it's, I just think he's saying sin is part of the human condition, period. It's, it's just part of being human. Yes, I think that's absolutely what he's saying in, in part. But I think he's trying to make the argument again that here's Adam, the first person who did it, whoever it was, who first sinned. Now Jesus is here to show us that there's a better way to live with God, right? And so there's, he's trying to make that rhetorical argument that through man, one man came sin, and through another man comes life and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, this process, this process of sinning has been around as long as humanity. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah he makes it clear that while it came through Adam, everyone's sin sets, right? <laughs> That's uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right there at the beginning where he goes, well, through Adam, we sin. And all sin, right? I mean, he doesn't even, in case someone's trying to slip out of it and say it's all Adam's fault, he goes, no. Uh -huh. We all do it. We, we're all. <laughs> As I said, it's part of the human condition. Uh -huh. It is. It is. So, so Adam brings the sin and Jesus uh, brings life. Right. Sin to life. So one man each, you one got brings brings the sin and the other brings life. Right. Simplified. He, he, he's trying to make it simple. Yes. Or at least understandable. Yeah, right. Understandable. 
Paul and Simple don't mix. Come on now. <laughs> no. no Paul, Paul never met a sentence he couldn't make longer or more confusing. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Don't, don't, don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just as you think you got it, he loves throwing a monkey wrench in it. So right, you he does. You are right. <laughs> he does that. He does that. All right, so I'm going to take y'all down just a little bit of a side road, but this is how. So, this is how Paul has been used through the centuries. Right. Um, we talked a little bit about it last time with um, Martin Luther focusing relentlessly on grace, that we only are saved by faith which is certainly part of Paul's argument, but it's not the heart and only part of his argument. And so when Martin Luther made some of those proclamations, some of it is fits perfectly with what Paul's saying. And some of it, you go, what is he talking about? Because he's so busy trying to uh, read into the text. That's called eisegesis. Um, he's trying to read a certain theology into the text versus trying to hear what the text is saying, what Paul's trying to say. Um, so another person who did that, so um, Paul likely wrote around 55 AD, uh, about 130 years later, yeah, give or take, Bishop Irenaeus of Lyon wrote against heresies. He's one of the first great um, theologians of the church, good old Irenaeus. Um, and it was, before it was Lyon, it was Lug. Uh, good thing they changed their name. <laughs> Lyon is a much more French name than Lug. But anyway, he wrote this book called Against Heresies. He was dealing with the Gnostic heresies, if you've heard of that. Uh, those, they're basically a group of believe, people who really did not necessarily believe Jesus was a physical being as much as a spiritual being, that he just, uh, while it looked like he died on the cross, it was really just his spirit. And so uh, he didn't really die. He just rose. They get kooky really quick. with But... And we don't also, but here's the thing for all of the heresies, we don't have any of them written down because the first thing you do when there's a heresy is to burn the book. Oh. <laughs> it's to burn the offending books, so we don't have a lot of their books. But Irenaeus looked at Paul's writings and all of this conversation about the old Adam being the one who, the original Adam being the one who introduces sin and death and Jesus being the new Adam who brings life and uh, redemption and describes this theology as recapitulation, that Jesus recapitulates the story of Adam to set everything right. Okay. Now, Paul argues that where Adam fails, Christ is the new Adam who succeeds. Irenaeus follows that perfectly, and he pushes a little bit just to say um, that Christ becomes the new Adam so that we can be united. It's not really a big push because that's exactly what Paul just said in the letter, right? In, the, in uh, Romans, he says this gives us a chance to be reconciled with God. So it's all right here in the same end of the pool. I don't think Irenaeus is doing anything too much there. And if he finished here, we could say that they agreed to exactly what Paul is saying, right? He stopped and maxed out by saying that this idea of recapitulation, and again, this shows up in a lot of Paul's writings. If you read Ephesians, if you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he makes references to the same idea um, in each of those books about how Adam has sinned, but Christ has uh, succeeded. Um, where there was disobedience, there is obedience. Um, so there's a legitimate part in a ways, though, where Paul sees the parousia, uh, that is, the, end, the return of Christ. Paul, as he's writing his letter in 55 AD, says, this is happening likely in my lifetime. People, you better get ready with God right now because he's coming back real soon. That is clear in all of Paul's letters. He's very much hopeful that Jesus will return because after all, now that Jesus has come, what's to wait for? for the conclusion of all things. Um, so the work of Christ will all come to fruition soon. That's Paul's theology. Uh, Irenaeus tweaks that one as we would today and say, well, maybe not next week after all. Um, it might be in our lifetimes, but it might also be another thousand generations before God. God's working it out in God's time. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I don't think, uh, while Paul might be disappointed to find out by the time of Irenaeus and certainly by our time that Christ has not returned, 
think you would go, okay, yeah, I may have gotten that one wrong, <laughs> right? That it was going to happen immediately. So he tweaks it. Logical tweak, Paul was long dead, still no Jesus, no Jesus now. So Irenaeus tweaks that side of it. And again, he's arguing against the Gnostics who denied the very humanity of Jesus, didn't believe Jesus was fully incarnate. So the good bishop, Irenaeus, emphasizes that Jesus is the new Adam and therefore a living, breathing man, not just a wise spirit. So Irenaeus, in other words, uh, actually, sort of to your point, Lynn, right? Uh, in this case, he doubles down on Paul's uh, declaration that he was an actual man, that uh, Adam was a man, was the most important thing, that he is this physical being. Irenaeus plays that up to counter the Gnostic. I don't know that that's exactly what Paul was doing with Adam, but it's not a violation of that argument either, right? To say that here are two human beings one is the incarnate God, and one was the creation of God. But he does, to counter those arguments, gets into that. So through Jesus' obedience, Christ undoes Adam's disobedience. So right now, we're still, Irenaeus is still right in Paul's wheelhouse. I think you can say that while there's a little tweak here and there, he has not done violence at all or changed the argument that Paul has made. Form, just pushed it in a couple of different directions to either correct it or to make sure that it's a counter to uh, right? Now, we are thus saved through Christ's obedience even to the cross. Irenaeus then makes a turn that is not Pauline. Um, Irenaeus proclaims, and this is the famous declaration of Irenaeus, Jesus became what we are, Jesus became human, that he might bring us to be even what he is himself. Jesus became what we are, that he might bring us to be even what he is himself. All right, so Irenaeus saw the recapitulation theory as opening the way for us to be reunited by God, reunited with God. I think Paul would be okay with that side of that argument. But he makes it clear that Irenaeus takes his line and pushes it all the way to the end, which is, it includes this idea that we can become God-like, if not God. This is called theosis, is the technical term. But Irenaeus takes this whole idea of recapitulation, it becomes what's called recapitulation theory of atonement, and says that because there's the old Adam and here's the new Adam, that through Christ we can become what God is. Now, this is not a theology of the West, but in the East, uh, especially in the Orthodox Church, this is the main idea for how Christ atones for our sins. That is, in the West, we have often focused on substitutionary atonement theory, that idea that Jesus died to atone for our sins. He paid the price in our place, right? He's a substitute for the punishment that should happen has largely preached. East, the Orthodox have taken Paul's arguments with Irenaeus's tweaks to a mystical union with God. Right? So that there's Adam, he brought in sin, then Jesus shows us a new way of life to be one with God, and so at the least we have a mystic, we are, the way is open for a mystical union with God. And at most, uh, there is a greater level of communion there. All of that is just to say, this is how some of this theology of Paul writes a letter to the church in Rome, and then people start laying stuff all kinds of on top of it. What do you think about recapitulation theory of atonement? I love it, actually. Irenaeus, okay. It, only I choose to look at it a little bit differently, uh, Bill. <laughs> no, and that is, okay, um, I cannot imitate God but I can imitate a human. And if Jesus was human, I can come a lot closer to imitating the human side, okay, than I ever mm -hmm. can the God side, if, so to speak. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I've always liked Irenaeus, okay? I, I, and, and am a big believer in that. It's really part of my whole faith system, Bill. Sure. What, what was that? Uh, Stefan, what did you say was part of your whole faith system? 
this whole thing, this whole thing. Uh huh. Irenaeus, okay. You know, I. Okay, Paul always in his letters says imitate him. Okay. Well, yes. I, uh -huh. I've chosen not to imitate Paul. Okay, I, I've chosen to go Irenaeus's route. Irenaeus. An mm -hmm. attempt to him imitate the human Christ. I can gotcha. never imitate the divine Christ because I'm not divine. I'm human. So, I mean, so that's how I have always interpreted what he said. Mm -hmm. and that's what I think about this idea. I mean, it's, it's kind of been, it's the basis of my faith. It, right? it almost seems like in, in what we have just talked about right now, we've just gotten to it. We just go one step, next step, next step, and we've gotten to what you have just described. Sure. Well, this, this year in, in EFM, the theme for our readings uh -huh. is, uh, is living into the journey with God. Yes. And we, we talk a lot about uh, theosis. Um, and it's a shame we don't have any of our year three people who can talk about uh, pseudo Dionysius or, or Dionysius, the Areopagite or whatever. But um, um, yeah, it's... Um, I, th I think it's fascinating. It, yes, it is. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I love uh, what Paul was doing here with talking of, because he's he's raised this, as you point out, the notion of this dominion of sin, this sort of life force or whatever. And then he's also talking about um, the dominion in life that comes through Jesus. Sort of uh, a counter force. Uh huh. Yeah. So I'm. I'm not. It's, just to be clear, I'm not condemning the uh, recapitulation theory or theosis or Irenaeus. Uh -huh. at least. Um, it's just to say that it's a very different way than the West tends to look at um, exactly. theology, right? I mean, that's just like cremation. <laughs> that Baptist model that we've all heard a million times, Jesus died for our sins, he died in our place kind of thing. Um, this is a much more gracious and I would say invitational way of looking at salvation. You know, imitate God, imitate uh, the physical Christ, uh, live into that. And this idea of mystical union um, is a much more broad theory uh, that is theosis has a lot more layers than just a simple sort of through line. There's because it's mystical, it opens lots of doors for ways to be connected to God uh -huh. and be through what they call the mystical supper, communion, right? That we would certainly as a uh -huh. and say that's one way. Um, but then there's a thousands and thousands of other ways that we can be connected to God by helping uh, feed the poor and the homeless and the hungry, by going down the list. There's a long list of ways that we can be in mystical union by living into the mind of Christ is one of the terms that they would use in that mystical kind of conversation, right? That uh, huh? if we're thinking and doing the things that Christ would have us think and do, then that is a way to be, uh, be on the right path. Not to be flip about it, but is this analogous to the, what would Jesus do bracelets? It's not, it's not unanalogous. <laughs> 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 yes. No, I mean, I, I think that's that it, it is certainly along those lines, but it's to push it farther to really say that it's um, being aware that what you're doing connects you to God, not just a um, the sort of flippancy of the, what would Jesus do, right? Like, well, just don't make the bad choices seems to be the sort of the implication there. Instead, it's no, no, make the good choices and know that it's going to deepen your relationship to God and other people, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, theosis. It always gets people tongue twisted and, and anxious, but um, it is a worthwhile thing. And again, I, you never know what some of these early folks would think about the later ideas. I do think Paul would probably be largely okay with Irenaeus's um, arguments that have been drawn from his. Again, two thirds of it is already his argument. 
I agree. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just that last little bit that turn to say that like there is this idea of mystical union and connection. Uh, for someone who is converted through a mystical experience, I want to say that he probably would be okay with that, right? I mean, he has a vision of Christ there on the road to Damascus. Uh huh. Be surprised if he had a problem with some idea of mystical union. And the idea in practice huh? in our Episcopal Church about a mystical union, I'm not sure how we, we practice that, how we embody that, how we have that part of our practice. Um, it seems that sometimes we step in that direction when we talk about Celt Celtic services. Um, I'm just not sure how I see it in our common shared practices. I would agree. Uh, Lynn, Stefania, you have an answer to that for how we do or don't live into the mystical at Holy Innocence? Lynn, you're muted. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I to, to me, it, it resonates, you know, I, I think I recall some of this as being kind of what Richard Rohr talks about sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and Rohr would, would write about the value of suffering in terms of, you know, um, getting the, the, the real you in touch with God as opposed to the, the false self that the, that the world has created, which I think is a pretty Pauline notion, sort of uh -huh. like no, the notion of the flesh and the, uh, but um, he also believes that in, um, with, in extending oneself to others, particularly others who are suffering in, in some form of need, that this is moving in toward union with God. That sounds good to me, Lynn. That really does. That, that, that's part of the mystical union. That is by doing, or let's say, I think someone said, make the good choices, helping. I mean, it, it, to me, it's like, Look, I, I remember when we had one, some of the SSJE brothers come uh -huh, to visit us yeah. one year, and they were talking and talking about prayer, and uh -huh. one of them was advising, well, thinking of th think of prayer in terms of looking at things from God's perspective, and what uh -huh. what does what does God want instead uh -huh. of thinking it from from your perspective and what you uh -huh. want. Uh -huh. and and sort of orient your prayer life that way and I mean I think if you're to me that's kind of where you're headed with theosis is, is trying to to move more and more into having the same mind as God can't but I'm sorry that's my opinion <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll second that I will <laughs> Um, I, I am not God, and therefore I do not know how God thinks. Uh huh. If He even does think, I mean, we we can go. Oh, this this we we can go oh, for right. this whole thing. So I'm going to back off just for. <laughs> <laughs> we can do this for the rest of the day and and on into next week. Uh -huh. well. <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Well, good deal. Well, we'll stop there, my friends. We're at that hour time frame, and I want to honor that. I know y'all have different things to get on in the day, but uh, as always, good to be with you. Love the conversation, and especially love thinking about uh, good old Paul and Theosis. It's a good way to good way to end. So uh, we will talk more next week, and we'll look at chapter six. Okay, great. Okay, that's thanks. Thank you, Bye. Hey, Bye. Is that right? Chapter Bye. six? Chapter six next Chapter week. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you very much.